podcast, we're going to critically examine the role of NGOs and international organisations in the developing world today. So non-governmental organisations, NGOs for short, are private organisations that carry out campaigning aid and development work. On the other hand, international governmental organisations, IGOs for short, try to help countries development, develop promote education and provide services such as aid and some examples of IGOs are the IMF, World Bank and the World Trade Organisations. So the features of NGOs is that they are groups of concerned citizens who are independent of the government and business and are thus non-political and non-profit organisations. NGOs have a charity status and raise funds through public donations and grants from governments. Many NGOs are tiny and focus on specific areas, but some are global institutions, have huge budgets and work in several countries on numerous types of development projects. So there are four main different types of functions that NGOs have, have and these are development, empowerment, education and emergency aid. So, development involves focusing on small-scale aid projects such as local integration schemes. Empowerment involves striving to give local communities a role in how aid projects are develop developed. Education puts a lot of so education, and um, we got the example of Oxfam puts a lot of money into developing education for schools and advertising to keep the to keep developing world issues in the public consciousness and you can also use the example of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as they're trying to create and create a network of private schools and also the final function of NGOs is to provide emergency aid so if there is a natural um, disaster then NGOs are often the front line of delivery of emergency aid so um, NGOs can be evaluated for their usefulness because they are more objective, because they aren't tied to governments which has policies that they would have to follow. Also, NGOs can target where the needs are greatest as they're not, involve in, in not involved or influenced by politics, so they're able to help the poorest in society. Many NGOs are members of the Disaster and Emergency Council and coordinate efforts to alleviate suffering and emergencies. For example, water aid isn't tied to religion, policies or politics. However, the problem is that 95% of developing countries are religious and they might be more inclined to support charities like Christian Aid. Um, NGOs can also help to promote development as they have operations to directly help those who need it by building schools and hospitals. They can pressurise governments to change ideologies, for example, Amnesty International constantly applies pressure to governments to change their view on the human rights. And NGOs have more willingness and ability to take risk when they have bases all around the world at local levels. However, the problems with NGOs have been highlighted by Halwood, who argues that NGOs have supported violent regime chains, for example, Christian in Haiti. Also, Collier argues that they mislead the public by stating that they know it's crap, but it sells t-shirts. Also, NGOs may not be able to gain access in some areas, as they haven't got the political backing, influence or power. For example, in Syria, NGOs constantly face a lot of red tape just trying to get in, and aid workers who are part of NGOs could be kidnapped by ISIS because they are believed to have some sort of political alliance. Um, NGOs also have massive uh, bureaucracy, which takes money away from donations, as most money that is donated pays the wages of the head office and pays for office space. NGOs may create more problems, for example, the clothes that are donated to developing countries will destroy the local textile industry. And Beck argues that in a risk society, um, we have opened our borders and we can see that there is organisations like ISIS who see independent NGOs as corrupt Western companies. And in terms of theories, the new right or um, neoliberals would argue that NGOs are wasteful and post-development theory believes that NGOs have failed.
in trying to develop a country. So now we're going to move on and talk, over, talk about international agencies. And the main thing is that rich, rich countries wield power through IGOs. And IGOs create a hierarchy um, as the, five, the top five of the UN have power of veto over other countries. So, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF for short, is an organisation made up of 185 countries that helps to provide loans to states going through financial difficulties. It gives advice to governments of developing countries on how to handle their economy. And similarly, the World Bank provides grants and loans to developing countries to build infrastructure and alleviate debt problems. And it also advises developing countries on how to make their economy grow. However, the problem with the IMF and the World Bank is that it attempts to impose an ideology bias model on poorer countries and only uses Western values of those on the board of members. And the World Bank and IMF also demand conditionality for loans and grants. So if we move over to the World Trade Organization, which tries to promote free trade, reduce barriers to trade and get rid of tariffs. However, the problem with this is that it only benefits Western nations who can take advantage of the lower prices. It lacks transparency as many negotiations take place behind closed doors and it puts the rights of co co corporations before the rights of individuals. And it locks countries into political decisions like tre free trade. So, another international agency which has been set up by the IMF and World Bank are Structural Adjustment Policies, SAPs for short, and these are designed to promote private sector economic growth by dere deregulation, privatisation, tight restrictions on government spending, reducing taxes and having an export market. However, the problem with SAPs have been demonstrated by Hong, who argues that the impact of SAPs has had a negative impact on developing countries because they have increased poverty, led to poor social conditions, led to environmental damage and caused social unrest. Another international agency are transnational corporations, TNCs for, TNCs for short. They believe that free trade is the best path to development and they operate in different countries. Contrivas argues that um, TNCs are good because they've increased taxes, they bring new technology, they increase employment and they raise aspirations. However, you could also argue that TNCs profiteer, they exploit their workforce and they have a negative impact on the environment. So in conclusion, NGOs, although they have some disadvantages, can be useful for working with small groups of people. Um, and it's IGOs that have a bigger negative impact on developing countries but we can't forget that in 2005 the G8 wrote off debts of 18 of the world's poorest developing countries.